And now, The Low Post. Welcome to The Low Post Podcast on a beautiful Tuesday morning. We are coming down the stretch of the NBA regular season. Thank the basketball gods. It will be the playoffs soon, the play-in soon. Teams have 16, 17, 18 games left. Everything is coming into shape. The contenders over here, the pretenders over here. And let me tell you, there are four teams in the entire stinking NBA that are in the top 10 in both offensive efficiency and defensive efficiency, the juggernauts, the real contenders. And there's some other real contenders that are almost there and deserve real contender status. But just for fun, humor me, only four teams In the top 10, the mighty Boston Celtics, who rebounded from a problematic loss to the Cavaliers, and then just a Nikola Jokic does stuff to us, and we don't really have recourse loss to the Denver Nuggets. They beat the Suns. They beat the Blazers. They're they're on course again. The mighty Celtics, they're first and second offense and defense. The Denver Nuggets have cracked the top 10 in defense. That should be a red alert, DEFCON 1 level alert for the rest of the league, because we know their offense will be fine. The Thunder have been sitting top five in both categories all season long. Just, hey, everyone want to be skeptical of us because we're young and our center's skinny? Okay, you go ahead. We're just going to keep on winning like lots of games and putting up awesome numbers. And then, under the cloak of darkness, while everyone is like fixated on the Warriors and the Lakers, which can make a longer playoff run, wait, they're ninth and 10th, and they're going to play each other in the play-in game unless the Kings and the Mavericks totally collapse. Oh, God, what are we going to do? And then the Clippers, all oh, the Clippers, we got to talk about the Clippers and they deserve it. They won a million games, they're fourth. And then let's talk about the East and the Bucks. They can get to the New Orleans Pelicans, eighth in offense and rising as Trey Murphy finds his game. Yes. And finds his rhythm. Sixth in defense, not sure how, kind of mysterious to me. Can, opponents continue to just miss every three against them. Maybe they have some impact on that. And fourth, in net rating in the entire stinking league. I've talked around it on previous episodes saying, hey, there's this team, they're they're in fifth. Projection systems are saying they're like a 95% lock to be a top six seed, no play-in like usual. They're, they're going to graduate from the play-in. Maybe we should talk about them. Maybe we should talk about the New Orleans Pelicans. Andrew Lopez, you used to follow this team until a tall French guy came into the league and started dropping five by five games in San Antonio, but you still follow them closely, if not physically. How are you, sir? I am. I am very good. And I think uh, the answer to how the new Orleans Pelicans are six in defense is the same as it was last year when the Pelicans were a top six or seven defense. Uh, And his name is Herbert Keyshawn Jones. That is the, it starts and ends with, with Mr. Mr. Herb Jones, not on Herb. Uh, being the the focal point of this defense and everything else kind of falls into play, but they are they are trending exactly where they want it to be preseason. I, I I said before the year if Brandon Ingram and Zion Williamson could both play sixty five games, that I thought this team was a could win fifty games. They are right on that pace right now. Now fifty games still may only get you five or six, if not, you know you're you're still fighting to be out of that play in tournament, but they are. Going in the right direction, they've got two healthy stars who are are playing games the way they're supposed to, and you got a Herb Jones on defense. So every every team should want a Herb Jones on defense. Uh, Herb Jones and Trey Murphy the third are the skeleton keys who unlocked this team. Even though one of them doesn't start, and I'm not sure there's a pathway to him starting. He, Trey, yeah. that's Trey Murphy, who after missing a bunch of games with what was it, calf or a hamstring? Meniscus. A ca- meniscus. meniscus. It was a meniscus. Okay. Um, it took about a month and a half for him to get his rhythm and is now just bombing threes from all over the place, doing a little more stuff off the dribble. You know, one running pick and roll was like he'll screen for Zion and then flare outside. And then the next step for him is he comes off that flare screen from Larry Nance or JV. One dribble, two dribbles can get he's, he's a little stilted with it. Like he's not an explosive dribble drive guy, but is big and mm-hmm. smart. And gets where he wants to go, but just sometimes it's one dribble, next pass, and sometimes the next pass goes to Herb Jones, and Herb Jones is making his threes, Andrew Lopez. And if Herb Jones is making his threes, he's going to be in the running for, and this is uh, perhaps not what he or his agent wants to hear, but from the team perspective, best contract in the entire NBA, a a like super duper role player that any team would want to have. Someone who can keep the offense moving in his own right with a little pick and roll here and there, a little dribble drive against the closeout here and there. Those guys are the skeleton keys 
that have unlocked this team. And look, their schedule has been easy lately. They've been beaten up yes. on the bad teams. And when you get a bunch of bad teams in a row and you catch a rhythm at the same time, you can trick people into thinking that you're a little bit better than you actually are. They play Cleveland tomorrow, then they have the Clippers. And what could actually be an important game if the Pelicans are going to make a run at the four seed, they kind of have to win that game. They also have two games left against Phoenix if they want to protect themselves from falling down a spot mm-hmm. or two. Um, so we're going to learn a little bit more about them as the schedule toughens up. But they have treated these bad teams like from the jump. Like you don't even belong on the same court as us. And we're going to be up like 40 to 15 before you even know what hits you. And the rest of the game will just be kind of like fake close and whatever. But like we are just going to absolutely spank you. And look, here's where we are. Basketball reference, 96% chance by their math that the Pelicans are a top six team. Playoff status, it's about 90%. And both systems give them about a 20% chance at the four seed. Most likely they're going to be the fifth seed. They're 50 to 60% chance there. Mm -hmm. Some chance at the fourth seed. But man, if that math holds, what a triumph for this team that's just been a play-in team, play-in team, scratching the claw and can't get our big three healthy together. Does the big three even fit? And I think that's still a viable question when you look at their lineup data. But I've described them as both a mystery box and a sleeping giant in the Western Conference. And right now they're playing like a sleeping giant. And if they just take care of business, they have four home games in hand coming to them. So they're scared. they've played more road games and home games. They take care of business. They're going to make the real playoffs not the play in playoffs. And, you know, depending on who they match up with, Clippers, Nuggets, Wolves, Thunder, if it's one of those teams, they are, they're going to come into those series with matchup advantage might be the wrong word in some of them, not all of them. Mm-hmm. Some of them are less friendly than others. But with some with some questions that those teams have to answer, and, like, there aren't a lot of good answers to those questions. Yeah, and it, let's go, I want to go back to January with this team because that's when – their schedule was the hardest. I think they had the the the, the toughest strength of schedule throughout the month of January. And for them, they just wanted to come out of that month at 500. And I think they finished nine and eight or something like that. It was, it was, they just squeaked by because they knew their February was going to be very easy and their start to March was going to be very easy. And I think one thing with this team over the past four or five seasons since Zion's been there. There's been games where when when they have to play the the teams they you know the, the top tier they're they're competing they're up there against them. It's when they play the bottom that they don't always bring their best game. They 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 walk through and they don't take care of business the way you would think a team needs to take care of business if you have playoff aspirations. Uh, that has flipped this year. Uh, I, I still have some questions about their their second half play. You know, and right now I think they're. You know, you mentioned uh, being number four in net rating. I think they're they're also number four, I think, in overall plus minus. But that's just because they're just destroying teams in the first half. They're they're fourth overall in plus minus, and I think twenty seventh in fourth quarter plus minus. Not a crunch, not a good time, place to be. Crunch, crunch time, time has is been not where the potential, not potential, the real fit. And spatial, like, Mm -hmm. where do you stand overlap between Ingram, Zion, to a lesser extent, CJ. CJ deserves a lot of credit for becoming a much more high-volume three-point shooter to make this whole thing work. Uh, But B.I. and Zion generally want to be in some of the same places at the same time. They only run, I checked this this morning, they only run seven pick-and-rolls per 100 possessions between them, and that's combined... The BI Zion version with Zion screening and the flip flip it around version with BI. That's like that's nothing. And that yeah. is it's not a red flag, but it is proof, I think, that there is a lot of wonky stuff to be worked out. Then you throw in a traditional center, things get crowded. By the way, their starting lineup is still minus still three yeah. for the season. They're minus 16 overall. That's total points. So it's basically zero um with McCollum, Ingram, and Zion on the floor. So that trio is still not clicking but willie green has been able to stagger minutes so that you just stay afloat with that group zion gets his time bi and cj get their time we find lineups that fit with both of them primarily because trey murphy the third is balling out and sometimes to kind of alleviate the everybody wants the ball or needs the ball and likes to work with the ball thing 
Like, we'll just start Larry Nance at center in the second half of games. And it's not a knock on JV. It's not even like we need better defense or more switchable defense, yeah. although Larry brings both of those. I really think it's we just need one less guy who wants to shoot and one more guy who wants to move the ball and set screens just to kind of loosen everything up. That lineup has been like no great shakes, but it's slightly positive for the season. There's just a lot of interesting levers to pull, and I just keep coming back to that young wing combo of Murphy and Jones as the skeleton key that has unlocked this team. In f- almost 500 minutes together, the Pelicans are plus 15 per 100 possessions. Not total, per 100 possessions with those two on the floor. Plus 143 total points in almost 500 minutes. I don't know how they answer this question in the long term in terms of like h- how do you start both of those guys because I think that's where this is going. But in the short term, this is a damn good team. And look, every game in the regular season and even more so in the playoffs is going to start from a two pronged question and question prong. Number one is okay. Who does the other team have to guard Zion? And the second flip side of that, and we can start on either. Actually, I'd like to start on defense. Is who does Zion guard on defense? Mm-hmm. How can we hide him? And what is the other team going to do to try to exploit him on defense? I think one of the things that's happened in this stretch is, This has been the best defensive stretch in the last six weeks of Zion's career. The effort has amped up. I think he's heard the noise about how he doesn't get any rebounds, and he's starting to rebound it a little bit more. And by the way, when he rebounds, one of the benefits of that is he can just go coast to coast, and there's nothing you can do with him. It's It's an offensive play as much as it is a defensive play. He's executing like their schemes when they have to close out or swap assignments on the weak side. His footwork's been good. He He's hit a new level there. But as you know, Andrew, the playoffs are going to be a game of where is Zion, bring him into the pick and roll, and we're going to test this guy like he has never been tested before. We've seen that even in clutch games last year. There were times where teams would seven, eight, nine times in a row just where is he? He's in the pick and roll every single time, every single time. He has looked as good as I've seen him in New Orleans on defense in these past five, six weeks. Um, I think he just had this stretch just now where he had, uh, I think it was seven blocks in the, in his last three games. He's getting to blocks that just don't, you're like, oh, oh, you can, you can get that again. And it's like, and I think he's starting to feel the same way. He, 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 I think he told reporters after the Philly game, which in Philly last year was where he hurt his hamstring and everything went haywire for the Pelicans. Um, and he's like, I, he's like, I'm still still working my way back. It's it, you know there was a, there was conditioning he had to do. If you look at him just physically, you look at Zion from the in season tournament where he was just he was he looked like a different player. Now he looks as good as he has, I think, in a Pelicans uniform uh, in, in the regular season, at least. And I think he he's starting to feel it, and he he's starting to realize what needs to be done. Going back to, to Herb and Trey for a second, Herb Jones is seventh in the NBA among qualified shooters in three-point percentage, which if you would have told me one of the two uh, Pelicans from the 21 draft class were shooting 43% from three this year, I was like, I would have put a lot of money on the fact that that was Trey Murphy. And yeah, the you'd, fact you'd, that be, is, you'd be moving into a smaller apartment right now had you had you I, made that bet. I very much so. Um, and the fact that it is Herb Jones speaks to the work that he's put in on his shot, the work that he and Fred Vincent have put in on his shot, and how much he has just developed as an offensive player. And then when you go to Trey, Trey, when Trey came back from that meniscus, like he he, he debuted, I think it might have been on December first, and when Trey started. The December minutes were like, okay, this is what we expected from Trey. And then right around Christmas, he took about three or four games off because he he's his knee was sore. Nothing bad, but it's when he came back from that that he wasn't the same player. And once he's kind of found where he is, things are are trending in the right direction overall. He's got, I think, three 28-point games just since the start of March. When he scores, not even, I was looking at it last night. If he scores 20, what's their record? 
when he scores 16 and he just gets over the 15 point mark, they're 11 and 0 this year. And he's obviously doing most of this off the bench for, because as you said, I, I don't see the path where he starts. I think it's some of their best lineups and credit to, to Willie Green is, I think when you do figure out what lineup is going to work for you in a second half, he sticks with it. Whether that's, okay, maybe Jose Alvarado needs to play extended minutes here. A guy who had who had lost his spot in the rotation in January before I think Dyson got hurt, comes back in and then is a, then is a key part. Does does Najee need to play a few more minutes? How, how, how much do I need to play Larry tonight? And he's not as married, I think, to that starting five as I think some coaches could be. And he figures out, all right, well, if this is working tonight, this is what we're going with. Um, it, but, but Trey hitting shots opens everything up and then you can figure out, okay, I can, whatever I need to do on the, on the, the side of the ball. But if, if they're hitting and if Herb is, is just continuing to, I mean, I can't even believe I'm saying Herb flirts with a 50, 40, 90 season, but as Herb Jones continues to do that and continues to develop Trey's hitting his shots, Z looks better. Z is, he is conditioned better. Things are just, you know, going in the right direction. I think at the right time for them. There has been a lot of talk for two years about Herb Jones and all defense. I would be shocked if he didn't make all defense this year. I, I would be too. I think. First or second team, I don't really haven't thought enough about it. Um, I'm going to actually talk about that with Kevin Pelton later today. By the way, I don't know if this has been publicized, but the all defensive teams are also going to be positionless, um, much like the yep. all NBA teams are. Um, he also belongs in the most improved player conversation and and there's been a little bit less attention to that i mean like i there are there five guys who have better cases than herb jones uh you mentioned a couple of names uh jose alvarado and dyson daniels they miss dyson daniels defense a lot yeah. but they have found something to your point about landing on lineups that work and sticking with them when bi is on the bench and cj is on the bench they've found this group of alvarado murphy naji marshall zion and Nance, that group is plus 54 in 48 minutes together. I mean, like, obviously that's insane and not sustainable, but it's, it's, there's something about that that works. Najee Marshall, I, a lot of Pelicans fans have a little bit of a love hate yet. No, no, no. Yes. Kind of relationship with Najee Marshall. <laughs> yeah. He gets a little carried away sometimes. Like, I don't know if I need you to like spin in the lane and try and up and under yeah. over like a help defender and all that. He just brings an edge to this team that I just absolutely love. And it's not just the obvious edgy edge stuff. Like he's talking to the fans in Atlanta. He's getting in people's faces. He's in the middle of every confrontation. You mess with Zion, you mess with him, like all that hockey enforcer stuff. He brings like a pace and a force in the open court and gets them moving. And when they run they're and especially when they run, when Zion's on the floor, they are really, really hard to stop. And like, they don't even care. So, all right, so let's go back to Zion. And the central question of, like, who do you have to guard Zion? Mm -hmm. If your answer is not good enough, you're just dead on arrival. Like, the Kings are dead on arrival against the Pelicans. It's Harrison Barnes, and Harrison Barnes has no shot. And you want to toggle the matchups to put Sabonis on him, and a lot of teams will do that, put their center on him and put a four on Valanciunas or especially a four on Nance when they go that way. The Pelicans are like, that's cool. That just screws up your defense even more. We're going to get your center in foul trouble. He can't stick with, with Zion off the dribble. You give him a runway. Okay, you're just giving like a tank a runway, a tank with like <laughs> a, a freaking jet pack attached to it, a runway, and he's going to run through you. Um, and just you look at the teams that they could face in the playoffs. Denver has a good answer. Aaron Gordon is a pretty yeah. solid answer. For the Clippers, it's generally Kawhi. And... Sometimes it's Zubats uh, when they when they toggle the matchups when Nance is on the floor. It's a lot for Kawhi. Like he can do it. He can do anything. Kawhi can guard yeah, anybody. He's Kawhi, it's a lot. Right. <laughs> Oklahoma City. It's generally Jalen Williams. Sometimes Dort. Sometimes Aaron Wiggins off the bench. Zion should be able to make hay against that. And if it's Chet, he's just going to put Chet in the basket, and Chet's going to have to use his height to maybe deflect a shot here and there. Um. Against Minnesota, it's a little bit up in the air now with Cat injured, but it's it's often been Anthony Edwards, uh, which is an unbelievable matchup, and sometimes Nas Reed. Like, and it's just it's fascinating to watch teams try to deal with this and try to arrange the matchups in a way um, that make it less painful. 
But it that's where everything starts and ends on both ends of the floor. And on defense, the Pelicans have also been playing a fair amount of zone, I think, to try to mitigate whatever matchup issues they have had. They are sixth in total zone possessions played and first in points allowed per possession while playing his own defense, first in the whole league, which means it's time to talk about the shooting luck. Andrew Lopez, <laughs> what's happening here? This is the second year in a row that the Pelicans have allowed a preposterously low three-point opponent shooting percentage. It's the lowest in the whole league. I'm just going to ask you, what's happening here? Uh, it's It's voodoo. It's actually all voodoo. It might be part voodoo. I think it's it's the jerseys. It's the new voodoo jersey. No, sir. I the, think the, what the it, skeletons, the skeletons, the skeleton. Halloween jerseys. I love the skeleton. Is it the King? Cake? You sent me a photo after the last podcast we did with the King Cake baby lurking mm. in the rafters yeah. of the Smoothie King Center, like just strolling around the catwalk, just just silently strolling yeah. along. Maybe it's that. Like if I were an opposing shooter and I looked, someone alerted me to that. I'd be like, "Oh my, this guy is just lurking up there." They is just gonna... they just have pictures of King Cake Baby in the locker room when you walk in. And they it's just... should do that. You should open up, but the lockers don't have doors; they're just stalls. So there's nothing. There's no surprise factor. Anyway, well, I guess so, there's the, there's that little door at the top where you can put your your personal items when you put your yeah your phone. Yeah, it, just put it up there. Just put it on the door up there. Okay, so so voodoo is your explanation. So. Aside from voodoo, I think it is who they are uh, allowing the three-point attempts to that uh, hasn't uh, been the biggest factor. Um, because we we brought this up before, and at, at some point, if you're, I think, at the top of the, the list in two consecutive years, at, at some point, it doesn't become just pure luck. It, there's something more to it, and I think... <laughs> I forgot when it might've been in December or January when I was, I was back there for something. And I, I asked somebody about it and it's like, and they said, but go look at who is taking the three point shots. And I think that is part of their defense is, is being true to the scouting report of who, who the shooters are, where, where those shots are coming from and where they're okay with shots coming from. Um, and sometimes that backfires and they do give up games where they're going to, you know, their opponents are, making 15, 18 three-pointers, and, and those nights are not good for for the New Orleans Pelicans. But the the fact that they are, I think those those nights are fewer and far between than what they have been uh, kind of stands out. So it, to me, I think it is who they are having uh, take the shots is, is what has um, kind of kind of dropped that number so far. And that's, and that's I mean, honestly, that's, that's a credit to a lot of guys. I know we. I mean, I joke a lot about the fact that a lot of their defense is just Herb Jones, but when Herb can can block threes and do everything that he does, but I think it's the entire team having a, a level of game plan discipline to know this guy's a shooter. We're okay with this guy who's shooting twenty eight percent to take three threes if he wants to, and going through there is 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 probably the better answer than voodoo. So I think some of that is is real. Like in in, in games where they bring JV or Nance high up on the pick and roll. So you got to really, you're almost, you're really putting two on the ball. And with JV, you're putting a slow guy as the second guy in the ball. Yeah. You're the rotations behind that mean that people are going to be open for a split second. And much like the nuggets play, you got to nail those rotations. And you look at those guys on the weak side, they're talking, they're on their toes. They're not making mistakes when they crisscross. They're not hesitating. They're crisscrossing to the right guy. There's no miscommunication. And it's, there's an urgency to it right now. Can they sustain it? Can Zion specifically sustain it? Because he's never played weak side defense at this level. Multiple rotations. This is the first time he's making multiple rotations within the same possession. Oftentimes, and particularly when he's on the ball in the pick and roll, defending the screener, it's one rotation and I'm out. I'm done. I'm chilling for the rest of the possession. That's not going to cut it. If he starts doing that again, they're dead on arrival in the playoffs. So I think some of it is real. They're also very long, like Ingram's yeah. long, Herb is long, Trey Murphy's long. And I think I'm starting to think that Zion like has some sort of unquantifiable he's not that bad deterrent effect on defense and even on the glass where you see this with old LeBron now where he's just big and smart and very respected and feared. And so even though he's slower 
and less active than he used to be, he's still in a lot of times like a, at least a neutral to plus defender because of who he is. I think there might be some of that going on with Zion because he's just gigantic. He takes up so much space. People know he's fast and explosive and can get up around the rim. I, I think there's some like, even when it doesn't look great, that there's some sort of like, kind of like the defensive lineman who doesn't get any tax tackles or sacks, but like two guys have to block him (laughs) at all times um, kind of thing going on. Um, However, I'm going 50, 50 luck, maybe 60, 40 luck because I went searching for the, Oh, they're just leaving the right guys open or their, their contests are unbelievable. And I think again, 50, 50 luck, by the way, is good. The skeptics would say it's a hundred zero luck. I think those skeptics are wrong, but there, so I, I looked at tracking data, catch and shoot threes. Just so let's just take the catch and shoot threes. Based on who's shooting, where they're shooting from, and how open they are, the Pelicans are allowing the they're they have the biggest negative gap between expected shooting percentage on those shots versus actual. So there something is happening there, and it's the biggest depressed gap in the league. Then I'm like, all right, let's see how close they are. Let me look at that because you can sort for like average distance to shooter, like yep. from defender. To shooter, they're like 20th. They're right in the middle of the league um, with 20th being closer to the most distant. So they're not like that close on average. So again, maybe 20th for them is really 10th for the average team because of how long and athletic they are. I think there's something to that, but I think they are getting a little bit lucky and I don't really know what that means for them. Like, does that mean a hot, a good shooting team is going to be more troublesome for them or a team like Denver who's like we don't even care about threes we're just going to beat you you're just going to out you you in the playoffs because we have the best guy and we don't need threes is more dangerous but I, I think there's something the other thing credit to their defense they don't foul much they're a good rebounding team and they force a lot of turnovers like they don't give you anything they don't yeah. take anything off the table defensively like they're pretty fundamentally sound at everything and that and that counts for a lot. We haven't talked about Ingram and I think that that's mm-hmm. I think that's almost a little bit sad um that almost no Pelicans discussion focuses on on Ingram. It's Zion 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 is Zion right. in shape is he not out of shape is he blah 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 and then how are the other guys fitting in and the book felt kind of written on BI like he's just a very good player who will make a couple all-star teams here and there. He's not an all NBA level player and maybe that's the book. I do feel like there's a Jalen Brown Western Conference version thing going on where his numbers in terms of raw production are a little bit down, like his scoring is a little bit down, his assists are flat, but I watch him and I'm like, this dude is just a better player. Like, I don't really care what the numbers say. He's just better. And to me, that translates to, and this is something you and I have talked about for years with Brandon Ingram is like, dude, can you, can you go to the basket with some self-awareness of how long you are because you're taking <laughs> really hard spinning eight foot spin away from the rim fadeaways where if you just can go, you're at the basket. He's going this year. He's at the basket. He's finishing 72% at the rim. He's finishing with power. He'll straight up bully guys now and then where it's just like, whoa, did he just spin and like shoulder block that dude out of the way and shoot over him? I think defensively, he's been a little better. I think his passing is a little better. It's nothing that's going to pop off the stat sheet. In fact, it's almost the opposite if you just look at scoring. I just think he's a better player who's fitting better into a number two, number 1.5 kind of role than he ever has before. And I don't think he's gotten enough credit for what's happening there. I think when you look at the raw numbers, and I think when you look at the raw numbers for both him and Z, both of their scoring is down three or four points this year. But it's because you have this depth, maybe one through nine, one through ten, where you you have guys you can trust. CJ's right there. I think CJ will be under twenty for his the first time in his career. But the the balance works out a little bit more. And I think with with Brandon, what we've seen is the efficiency is slightly up this year. Um, the three ball has really come back after after not being there uh, the start of the season. That was. Uh, a, a big concern, both on, I think in in attempts and in just he he just wasn't making them. But we we know how how good his 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 mid range is. But to your point, it does feel like there's more times in a game where he's like, oh, I have these very very long arms, 
then I can just get it a, around whatever rim protector you have down there. Or I can, and, and he feels like he's finishing stronger more. There's more times you you see, you know, him get in there, finish with a dunk, finish with a very, very long lay. Like he's getting, he's just going for his shot more. And there have been games, I think, where both him and Z, when they figure out, all right, Eric, this is my night. I'm going to go off for 28, 30, 32, and it's a very efficient night. And there's other games where, oh, this is somebody else's night. And I, I, there's been more nights where I think where Z has had maybe 14 or 12 points. And if you would have had that scenario two to three years ago, if Zion was only scoring 12 to 14 points in a game, I'm, I'm going to guess their record was a lot worse than what it is this year. Uh, but I think Brandon taking over has he's, – he's figuring out his spots more. He's getting to those spots a little bit better. Him and Z early on were going through – essentially private post-practice workouts with James Borrego. Everybody um, there talks about how the three guys are talking a lot more and breaking yes. down film a lot more and spending a lot more time together talking about how to be, where to stand, how can I help you, how can you help me? There was a game, I think, recently. I, I forget what game it was, but Brandon like tweaked his ankle first quarter. Might have been the Knicks game. And I think Brandon tweaks his ankle first quarter does the, the old basketball player thing where you just you you tighten your shoe up and you you just keep going. And I think he said after that game, he told told the reporters, I, I couldn't I couldn't leave Z out there for this one. I think they might have been missing some guys for that game. But it, it's when those two talk and they've done it on multiple occasions this year, you know, why are your numbers now? Why is it it's it's because we we want to win. We understand what it is. And I think those those post early post practice sessions with Borrego really put them on the same page. There was a very, I think it was a, a post in season tournament. There was a, a, a team meeting. We all love team meetings, but the the initial point in that first team meeting was this team is only going to go as far as Brandon and Zion take us. Those are our two best players. They have to act like our two best players, and I think that is part of what has got them talking more off the court, talking more on the court, working through those things with Borrego, working through. Okay, we need to. Where do you want the ball? Where hey, it's a, it's a it's a Brandon game. Let's you know, Z has said it a couple of times when Brandon's had big games. Well, I saw what he was doing, so I got the ball and I got out the way. So I think they they realize between each other a little bit more of what is needed if they want to continue to you know push forward and, and go at this you know and and win games basically, and they know that that's what it's going to take in the playoffs. You, you can't win in the playoffs without buying into the ugly stuff, the tough stuff, no. the nasty stuff. And you would hope that for both of them, but particularly for Zion, this stretch, and again, they're fattening up on bad teams and good teams are coming, but this stretch and these qualifications we're talking about in terms of what their numbers say about them are sort of proof of concept like, oh, if I do this, wins come. And if wins come everything else takes care of itself. Like regardless yeah. of if my scoring numbers are down, whatever, like all the glory, all the whatever, all the money comes when we win. And this is, if this is what's helping us win, well, then it's, it becomes a cycle that just sort of feeds on itself. The bigger question is like, where is this all going for this season? Like how good is this team actually? Right now, the most likely playoff series period in the first round of the Western Conference is Clippers Pelicans at four or five. Yeah. But we'll see if that happens. A lot can change. I would be, <clears throat> depending on how the Wolves look without Towns, and I'm worried about the Wolves' offense without Towns, I think people are are probably underselling the impact of that injury. And we, we don't know when he's going to come back. Maybe he's ready for the first round and everything's great. Maybe not. I, w I could never pick New Orleans over Denver. That's just the worst possible matchup if that happens. I think the other three matchups are winnable for the Pelicans. I don't know that I would pick the Pelicans to win any of those series might Minnesota is interesting without towns. Minnesota right. is vulnerable without towns as great as their defense is. Look, the Clippers, the, it's easy to not trust the Pelicans. They haven't won a playoff series. They have a strange team. We talked about the shooting luck, but there's like a, a lot of players who lean very strongly defense, very strongly offense. Zion is this weird piece, like our team's going to pick on him. Can they ever play him at center, which is a lineup we have not seen much of this year? Um, you know, how does this actually all fit together? Easy not to trust them. 
Like, and we saw them fall on their faces on the biggest stage that they've had with mm-hmm. Zion on the floor in the in-season yep. term. Zion hasn't played in the playoffs yet. Um, but I'll tell you right now, the Clippers, for all their pedigree, all the experience, all the understanding they have about what's at stake for them, for this franchise, for all these L.A. dudes who grew up together and have been in this league together and came for this team to help this team finally get over the hump, they better bring their A game in that series. Because if they don't bring their A game, they could find themselves in a game seven against the Pelicans, and you don't want to be in a game seven anywhere. Oklahoma City, I think people are underrating the Thunder. I think the Thunder are just awesome. I'd probably yeah. pick the Thunder in that series, but Zion's a problem for them. And like if they get that series a little bit grimier than the Thunder might like, like that could be a series. Like this team is actually dangerous. Now, if they fall further and go on a losing streak and they're in the play in tournament, it's a disaster at this point. They need to be in the top six. If they keep playing like this and hang in at five, don't think they can get four, but it's not out of the question. I I think that first round series is a war. Like, I don't think this, I I mean, walkover, no one thinks they're a walkover. I think they have a better upset chance against anybody but Denver than people might give them credit for now. Yeah, I I, I think I agree with that. And especially, I think the Minnesota matchup without Cat really kind of stands out, especially. Like I said, if he's not there, that that changes a lot of things for them, especially offensively. But I mean, right now against the Clippers, I mean, they're this this game what Friday they're two and one the against the Clippers. They're two and two one, and against, one against, the Clippers. against the Clippers. Now I will say that one loss I think was at home, and it was one of those losses where you 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 step back and you go, this this team's just not it. It's it was a big game. I think it was a Friday. It was. I think I think it was like a 16 point game, but it was not a 16 point game. Like, and by it, the way, they're two and two against the Wolves, and Zion missed both the losses. Yeah. So, which is why I think that that's intriguing. I think they're one and one against OKC right now. There's a there's another game against OKC. I think late uh, end of the month. So, really big end of the month for a team that now has I think the eighth or ninth toughest remaining schedule, as you as you've pointed out. But I I, I think I agree with you on all points there. I think I think. Denver, uh, Denver is just <laughs> Denver is just a tough matchup for anyone. Uh, that's that's what happens when you're the defending champion. Denver, but... Denver is on a different planet yeah. in experience and polish from the Pelicans. All due so, respect to the Pelicans, Denver just is in a different universe of life. It just that would be different. Now, I, I think when you see the Clippers, they even before this, and and I know some of the, a lot of this was sometimes missing one or two of their pieces but they had matched up good against the uh, traditionally well against the, the the clippers it's also when jv seems to hit all of his threes i think if you go back and look like he's he's had that seven three-point game in, in in staples i'm sorry well i guess it was staples when he had the seven three so i can say that um he's had another game where he's had five or six threes against the clippers so they've they've matched up well there but in the first round, like that's that's going to be one I'd, I'd I'd really like to see. I think the most. It's also a tough one for you. Can only have Herb guard one guy. Yes. And if the guy is Harden, then Kawhi has a whoever it is. Kawhi is enjoying life. And if it's Kawhi, Kawhi has a size advantage and a strength advantage over Herb, and the other guys are enjoying. That's a tough. That's a tough matchup for the Pelican. They're a tough matchup for everybody. That's why the Clippers have these three dudes. That's where I think Brandon Ingram's defense becomes which and he's he's improved this year i'm not going to say he's an he he's a plus defender or anything now but i think he has taken a step up especially with off ball stuff this year um he looks a, a little bit better but he becomes very important in a series like that Najee marshall becomes very important in a series like that um you know he's probably playing way more you're probably going to some of the uh just because of the lineups that ty Lue will throw out there you're probably going to some larry nance lineups earlier and more often than uh than than what you you would in a regular series but i think of those of those four the clippers is i think the most intriguing matchup but i think that the the wolves minus cat would be maybe the one that i think if you're in new orleans i think you would want a little bit more but i don't i I don't think think like you said i don't think they're a pushover in any of them i think Um, the clippers matchup is really fun I think the most fun is, is the Thunder, but the Thunder are edging toward yeah. the number one seed right now. Um, just to, this is a like keep an eye on the Pelicans because they've gone under the radar. They're not under the radar anymore, the way they're playing. And uh, Andrew Lopez, they've never been under your radar. You spend a lot of time around this team. And as soon as they get really good, you go cover the Spurs. But at least you have Wemadama, yes. who's just 
Six by fives Absolutely. are coming. Absolutely. Six Absolutely. by fives. Look, five by twenty five by five fives. Threes. I know what's the most by fives. You can have in the in the in in the NBA. The guy is absolutely ridiculous. Read you had a piece yesterday about uh, how twenty point leads are no longer safe in the NBA. Yes. Uh, read that, and there's more. There's more. There's some stuff coming on the Spurs in Wembenyama from Mr. Andrew Lopez. Does bang up work all over the Western Conference. Thank you for your time and your knowledge, sir. Thank you. All right, let's bring in one of my favorite guests. Time to go around the league and start thinking about awards. Nobody I'd rather do that with than ESPN.com's Kevin Pelton live from Seattle with the Sonics logo in the background. Sue Bird in the Seattle Storm I see you over there. How are you, Kevin? I, I'm doing well, uh, despite the Kraken being, uh, you know, trading away players at the trade deadline. So I'm, I'm sure you wanted that update on the Kraken. Yeah, I saw that the Golden Knights did stuff that made people either angry or totally in awe of their aggression. I don't really understand what happened. I will tell you, I was hanging out with some children this weekend, as I want to do, at a trampoline park and uh, taking take one of a couple parents chaperoning some children. Speaking of Seattle, a I believe he's 12, was wearing a Seattle Supersonics shirt. Nice. And I complimented him on the shirt. Just very old man moment. I had to like quiz him. I'd be like, "Do you know? Okay, does the team still exist?" He get he got that one right. No. Where did the team move? He said Las Vegas. I said, "Okay, we got to like, you got to sit down, young man, and we're gonna have a little talk about the <laughs> Seattle SuperSonics and what might hopefully happen in the next five or ten years." A very old man moment for me. All right, I brought you on to go through the all defense teams preliminarily, just for fun. A good way to talk about a lot of players and a lot of teams uh, to review. Only 10 guys make the all-defense teams. There's not three teams or four teams. There's two teams, five players on each. And for the first time in a long time, if not ever, I can't remember off the top of my head, no positions for all-defense. There's no guards. There's no forwards. There's no centers. There's no nothing. It's going to be just like all-NBA where it's five guys. You want to pick five centers for first-team all-defense? You can do that. You think that is unrepresentative of how actual basketball works and that a fake team, even a fake team of five players should have like a point guard or a guard who can get around screens and a center and a wing. You can vote that way too. It opens up a lot of interesting possibilities. I have my very long list of candidates right here, probably about 50 names. And we got to whittle that down from there. Uh, will you have a ballot on this one? Do you know what you'll have a ballot for this year? Uh, not yet, but uh, I have in the past. Where do you want to start? I open I open the floor to you. I didn't I didn't really pick first or second team. This is not final for me. There's still a month left in the season. I just thought it would be a fun way to go through a bunch of candidates. Who's a must? Is Wembenyama going to make it? Does he have a case for defensive player of the year? So I I, I guess I would start with to to you whether it's first team, second team. I don't know how you did it. Who's like just a give me like one or two just non-negotiables. Like positions aside, whatever aside, like these guys have got to be on. I should remind people. I had to remind myself about the 65 game limit and then check for who's going to make it and who's not going to make it. So Donovan Mitchell got a lot of publicity today and yesterday. He's now out. He's not going to make 65 games. If Kristaps Porzingis is your cup of tea for all defense, it's too bad. He's not going to make it. He's going to make it to 64. That's the most he can play. Other guys, not necessarily for this, but just in the news, Thank the basketball gods, Alper and Shengun did not suffer a serious injury for his own health and basketball development primarily, but he's also a leading candidate for most improved player and is at 63 games. So if he had missed the season, he was going to be out for that. Um, that's one of the awards that this counts for. It doesn't count for rookie or all rookie, the 65 game thing. And Jalen Johnson, who might be the favorite for most improved player, has got to play all but one of the Hawks remaining games, 17 of 18 to get to 65 on the dot. There's going to be more of these cases that turn up like OG and would have been a no brainer for one of these teams. He's out. Can't vote for him for all defense. Like it, this is just reality now. So with that in mind, KP, just give me a couple non-negotiables. Got to be theirs. All right. Well, quickly on the 65 games thing. I mean, there was a lot of talk about it, obviously when Joel Embiid got injured and, you know, I think that was a somewhat different situation because, you know, Embiid is going to be miles short ultimately to me, the most aggravating thing is going to be, you know, if a player who is clearly good enough to be on one of these teams plays like 63 of the first 64, 65 games, Carl Anthony Towns was in this boat, although he's probably not good enough that he could have missed the last month of the season and still made it anyway. 
And if that player gets knocked off, who hasn't missed any time for rest or anything like that, but just happens to suffer an injury this week instead of the week after when he would have been eligible, that's going to really underscore the ridiculousness of this rule. Uh, so, yeah, you mentioned Porzingis being ineligible, OG Ananobi ineligible, obviously Embiid, Draymond Green, Evan Mobley. So this is knocking off Jimmy Butler. So this is knocking off some guys who would have certainly been on that long list, if not on the short list. And uh, yeah, I tiered it out. And my philosophy on this is going to be more strict with positions than it is with all NBA team because the defensive assign, uh, you know, the defensive responsibilities, the defensive importance is just too wildly different as you go across the positional spectrum. If you're actually picking the 10 most impactful def defenders in the league, odds are like six or seven of them are going to be centers. But I do think you have to kind of adjust that importance relative to position. So I'm going to view it as I have the flexibility now if you know, there are four centers that I want on the team or there are five or six big men. That's fine, but it can't be all big man or or all perimeter players. So that's how kind of how I viewed it. And I had I tiered it out and I had three interior players and one perimeter player who are just like in a tier of their own. And I think these okay. are the defensive me, player let, of the year candidates for me. Let me stop you there. And I want to create some suspense, but on 65 games, a couple of things I'm reading the CBA now. There is a little subclause within a subclause that if I'm reading it right and I'm not a lawyer and I, I may not even be able to play a lawyer, so I may be getting this wrong. But I think if you play 62 regular season games and then suffer a season ending injury and those 62 games comp comp comprise 85 percent of the games that he could have played in, oh, okay. you are still eligible despite being short of 65. That's going to be a rare circumstance, obviously. More broadly, I. One million percent agree with you for, and I've said this before, for third team all NBA. I don't know, second team, I'm not sure. I haven't thought about it yet. But third team all NBA has always been my place for like this dude played 55 games, but we just know, like it's Kevin Durant. Like we just know that he's better than 79 games of Julius Randle. Like we know, let us put that guy on third team all NBA, check the box, blah, blah, blah. Same with all defense, like OG. And I'm just making this up. We know this guy for 57 games was the best defense player in the league. Let us put him on all defense. And as I've said before, the unintended consequences on that all NBA front is you're going to get younger, healthier players who no one thinks are super max level players who become super max eligible because all the old guys age out of the 65 game thing. And if you're super max eligible, you're getting the super max. That's just how it works. Now you might get some wiggle room between the 25% and the 30% or the 30 and the 35%. But it becomes a, a a floor that your team almost has to meet or else the relationship becomes poison. So I am with you a, a million percent, particularly on third team, all NBA. I would even say most improved player. Like, I don't really understand why I have to hit 65 games for most improved player if I've shown improvement in 58 games. Um, with all that said, let, let, let me hear the four names. I don't know if you, you don't have to say them all now, but let, let's go through them because I'm interested to see how much overlap we have. So on the perimeter, I think there's one guy who's in a class by himself and, you know, he hasn't played as many minutes. So I think it's going to be hard for him to get on the defensive player of the year ballot, but he has played defensively at that level. And that's Alex Caruso on the interior. Then I had three guys, Bam, Rudy Gobert, AD are my kind of non-negotiable all defensive team picks. Okay. So Caruso, Caruso is not on my non-negotiable list because of the minutes played, but He's been unbelievable and he might end up on my, my non-negotiable list is like three guys long. Um, so don't take that as like, he's not making an all defense team. Um, he is now starting, which I think helps his case immensely because if you're a backup, it's just sort of not, maybe not as much as conventional wisdom suggests, but it does deflate how often you are out there against the very best, not only opposing players, because there's always going to be a good player out there to guard, but the best opposing lineups where, Every player is more dangerous by virtue of playing next to other super dangerous players. Um, and the Bulls have been miles better. defense. They're just completely different teams. They're an elite defensive team with Caruso on the floor. And this is like the third year in a row of this happening, basically. And a dismal defensive team without Caruso. The advanced numbers love him. I, I guess I don't really have a good reason for him to be a non-negotiable other than I, 27, 28 minutes a game is not so, so many. But um, and, he, he's, and he's missed some time. 
Yeah, and he's missed. I, is he going to get how many games? Is he going to get to? He's going to make it pretty easily, from what I recall. If, if he stays healthy, he'll be oh, you know, he can miss a game or two. I think he's got some wiggle room. Um, I don't, I don't have. I, I he's been extraordinary. Like what it, for people who may not be watching the Bulls, what is it that you see that makes him? I mean, forget the numbers and the advanced numbers, which are outstanding. What do you see when you watch him that makes him worthy of this sort of honor over guys like? Um, in like your non-negotiable list over Derek White or Herb Jones Jr. Or guys that are going to be on other people's non-negotiables. Yeah, and and who are just below this tier certainly for me. I'm, I'm not saying any. Well, is you not having Caruso in this tier is not like he's yeah. not all defensive. Same thing for me. I I think it's the combination of impacting plays, you know, generating turnovers, you know, creating blocks. And also the on-ball defense. Like there are some guys you have to trade those off a little bit. And the defensive versatility that allows the Bulls to play these lineups where since Patrick Williams' injury, you know, it's DeMar DeRozan is kind of nominally the four on offense. And Caruso oftentimes is sometimes is defending the four, you know, depending on matchups. It's just whoever is going to be the opponent's most threatening player, uh, particularly more on the interior, because now you've got Io Desunmu in here, who is someone on my long list on the perimeter. The numbers don't quite back that up as, you know, all defensive candidate. But uh, it's the same thing as last year when you had Caruso and Beverly and those two guys kind of amplified each other in that lineup. Uh, that played so well for the Bulls to finish the season. I mean, he's out there defending guys who are, you know, four or five inches taller than him on a regular basis and and defending them well, and then also having a lot of impact as a help defender. How excited are you already a month out? Like, are you starting to break down the film, really dig into the X's and O's for the Bulls, Hawks, nine versus 10 play in loser's bracket game? Are you, how, like, what level Super Bowl... NFC championship. Like, where are we? I mean, the bull, this is only the bull's second time in the play in, right? The Hawks are like the, the play in the play in team. I think Trey young had a lot of the career records was up there for a period of time. Uh, you know, presumably he's not not going to be around for the play in this year, but you know, it, it is a very fitting play in matchup. If we get the Hawks and the bulls again, there are five games between the number nine bulls who are 31 and 34 and every time you think, oh, they're starting to play well, they get walloped at home by the Mavs as they did last night. It's a real, really depressing Vooch game last night. It was just like, ugh. Uh, and then the Heat at 35 and 29, five games up in the last column. Would it be acceptable if executives from both the Bulls and the Hawks just called the league office and were like, you know what? We don't really, de- we just don't deserve this. Like, we'll just, we'll just bow, we'll just bow out of this one. Let's do a best of three between the other teams for the seventh seed or something like that. We, we, we're out here. I know the TV money's been sold, but maybe, maybe let, let a couple West teams in. It's sort of like the, uh, the inaugural year of the play in in the bubble where you had to get within a certain amount of the eighth seed to trigger the play in. And we didn't have that in the Eastern Conference when we had it in the West with the, uh, the Grizzlies versus the Blazers. And, and that was, going to be a mini series if the uh the grizzlies had won the opening game right so maybe maybe we do bring just that idea back off in the east this year so you had gobert bam out and anthony davis as your non-negotiable bigs yep they are also on my first column of like if this would be my very very tentative like not even in pencil first team they're, they would all be on it right now. Now, bigs you didn't name are Victor Wembanyama, Brooke Lopez, Giannis Antetokounmpo, some others that we can talk about. I think Gobert's case is pretty self-evident. He's the anchor of the best defense in the whole league. And I actually think as, as we get deeper into it, um, one of the sort of cause celeb omissions last year was Jaden McDaniels. And I wonder where he will fall, where he did fall in your analysis. Cause I think it's going to be borderline for him again, very clearly. Once you start listing names, you get to 10, you can get to 10 pretty fast without listing him. You could list him eighth, seventh, ninth in that, in that stretch. I do think he's been outstanding this year, maybe even better than he was last year. And I don't mind the idea of this team's defense has just been so much better than everybody else's in the league. Like they've been two and three points ahead of number two per 100 possessions almost the entire year. 
I don't and and three players are clearly driving the bulk of that value, and that's Ant, McDaniel's, and Gobert. And I think Ant is third on that list. Now that might that statement may cause a little bit of controversy because Ant has talked a lot about how he's a stopper and he should be all defense. And I don't disagree that he has that kind of ceiling. I don't think he's consistent enough and particularly off the ball yet. But where did you fall? Where's McDaniels for you? So I have five perimeter players in my first two tiers that to me, those guys are on the team. And then Jaden is in that next tier, along with Anthony Edwards, who's a little lower, but in that same tier. And that's where it comes down to, I I have Jaden at the top of that tier, but it sort of comes down to, do I want to put five interior players and five perimeter guys, or does Jaden get that last spot? So uh, Gobert is unassailable. I think Anthony Davis and Bam Adebayo are unassailable. And that that may, like the Lakers have been an okay de- to decent defensive team for most of the year. Um, I think they're actually technical. Some of these, you know, th- every year I do this and every year I'm like, I'm not sure how much stock to put into some of these on off numbers. You really have to know the context of every team and the lineups that they're playing and the lineups that they're facing because the Lakers and- are wor- worse defensively with Anthony Davis on the floor, which is like nonsense. The guy has been unbelievable all season. And maybe more than that, the context of the three point shooting that just swings, drives these swings so dramatically all the time. And I think that is a factor for AD because uh, one of the factors I can, cons- one of the stats I consulted here was a luck adjusted defensive RAPM that Christian Narsu is publishing. And he comes out much better there than he does in the kind of standard on off. I think he's been tremendous the entire year in both the sort of loud ways like blocked shots and challenges at the rim and the quieter ways of just positioning versatility. And it's, you'd be hard pressed to find a big man more versatile than bam, uh, whose team has been better with him on the floor defensively, who's kind of been like at times the only constant on the entire team really. And just does a little bit of everything. I think he's had kind of maybe his best rim protection interior sort of traditional interior defense season, maybe, um, he gets known is known more for switching and his versatility. He's just so indispensable in a, everywhere all the time. I, I don't know if it's gonna be first team, second team, but he was one of the five or six names that to me had to be on the team. By the way, the Heat um have lost three in a row after uh a very eh loss to the Wizards. Can't lose a game to the Wizards. And I believe they have the Nuggets coming up tomorrow. That's a tough one. After that, their schedule is pretty easy. We might as well just talk about it now as a side. This car crash from four to eight in the East is, I think, maybe going to be the most interesting part of the standings in the last two weeks of the season. Everyone will gravitate to the West in the play, and I get that. But the Knicks are four at 37 and 27, and the Heat are eighth at 35 and 29. Five teams, Knicks, Magic, Sixers, Pacers heat for the last three spots outside of the play in two will be outside looking in playing each other in the play in the Knicks and the Sixers play each other tonight in a massively important game. The Sixers will have Tyrese Maxey back reportedly or likely OG Ananobi appears likely to come back for the Knicks. That's a fun game. Who's I, what have you I pick a team in there? Just like, let's riff on one of the teams. Who's interesting to you of that group. Why aren't the Knicks playing Boyan Bogdanovich more? when they can't score right now. It's very confusing to me. I thought like a lot of the value of, uh, you know, someone who, you know, I love that trade. I think you did as well. Like a lot of it was, or, or at least a part of it was, this is someone who can help us survive the absence of Julius Randle. And now he's playing like 10 minutes a night off the bench as their backup for, well, they can't score. It's very confusing to me. But, you know, to the kind of the larger point though, like the West avoiding the play-in is important, but, you're still going to be the sixth seed. One of these teams in the East is going to get home court advantage in the first round. And another one is going to potentially best case scenario, have to face Boston in the opening round. Like that's a pretty wild swing in your chances of winning a playoff series. And it, look, I know the heat have like magicked up these long playoff runs from low seeds, including from the play in last year. They do not want to do this dance over and over again, where just so many things have to hit right. And they're so close to the edge of like, if Max Struess doesn't get hot against the freaking bulls, we're just not even in the playoffs after losing the first play in game to the Hawks. Um, And obviously they're the team given their playoff track record that sends the shivers 
down the spines of the elite teams because they've beaten them all. No matter what their record is, the Heat are the, are respected. What? Like, it seemed like they had figured it out. Now, they've had some injuries. Tyler Hero's out again. What What's lacking to you? Late, maybe maybe of both of late and just overall, like what are we waiting for, for this to just like actually click into place the way it feels like it should? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I guess, are we saying that it feels like it should based on these playoff runs? Because, you know, other than that 2021, 22 regular season where they were atop the Eastern conference, like we have a pretty long track record of Miami not being that good in the, in the regular season. I mean, part of that is, is Jimmy Butler and he has, it seems, flipped the you know it's a, a little bit before daylight savings time but he's he's flipped on the switch to you know play off jimmy and the fact that that hasn't translated to wins the last few games is a little concerning but also you know just i think this is the nature of when we talk about a lot of these teams in the west and these teams in the east as well like someone's bound to get hot and win two in a row and you're like oh this is the team they're gonna do it but it did nothing fundamentally changed about them they just you know made threes for a couple games no pun intended. If they, and I'm not saying it's totally in their control, like they just may not be that good of a team over like a 150 game sample size if you made that up. But no pun intended, they're going to get burned one of these years when they take the regular season for granted. If they almost did last year, at some point it's going to happen where they get into the play in and it's like, oh my God, the Heat aren't even going to make the playoffs. And they want to, they they can talk all they want about how we'll turn it on when it matters and Jimmy becomes playoff Jimmy, blah, blah, blah. Like, they want to be sixth and higher. They do not want to be in the play. And I know that. I've talked to them. They know what the standings are. They went through it. They were totally demoralized last year when they couldn't get over the hump and couldn't get into the sixth seed and had to go through the play. And they don't want to do it again. I would just offer this. You, you you make a good point about Bogdanovich and his minutes are strange. And it's not the first time the Knicks have made a trade acquisition, although this is a much higher level than Cam Reddish. And the coach hasn't played him as much as perhaps and, everybody and, thought. And the coach was more clearly right in that situation. <laughs> yes, the, that one worked out well. Cam Reddish still, Lakers are still trying to make Cam Reddish perimeter stopper guy happen. And I'm I'm not, they're trying to make it happen less than before, which is good. Um I would like to look, Eric Spolstra is probably the best coach in the entire NBA. He forgot more about basketball as I'm saying the sentence than I will ever know. I think I'd rather just not have the Nikola Jovic thing happening in, in my starting five anymore. And he's actually played. Okay. I don't really understand why both Caleb Martin and Jaime Hawkins jr. Have to come off the bench. Um, I'd like to just play my best lineups right from the start of games and a little bit more often. That would be one just low hanging adjustment that I would make if I were, if I were the heat, although Jovic has played. Okay. He's pushing the ball up. He's making shots, whatever. I just, those guys are just better than him. And when hero comes back, um, they have some interesting decisions to make among the, read me the names of the perimeter guys who are your, you said you had five. I think that if you decide to have five, you will have these five most likely. No, these guys are in to me. These are these are my five that are in, and Caruso being one of them. And then the next tier, you mentioned Herb Jones, Jalen Suggs, Derek White, and then Shea Gilders Alexander is the other one who's in that group to me. Ooh, I like that one. He's on my long list. I couldn't quite get there. So so we have a lot of the same names. I, I would have to me, Derek White is a non-negotiable. And to you, he's not, and we disagree. And I'm interested to hear why that is for you. Herb Jones is in for me, is on my tentative sort of like short list of the final 10, 12 guys, whatever. Uh, Suggs, Suggs is incredible. And I, I think he's earned a spot. Uh, by the way, kudos to Jamal Mosley, who uh, signed a four-year extension today or agreed to one anyway um, with the Magic, according to Woj has done an incredible job. The Magic were in New York last week. I got to visit with some of their people and actually was like, is he going to get extended? Because if I were his agent, I would ask for it right now while we're sitting in the four seed. Um, and they, they're a top five defense still. Like that has had complete staying power. They're rugged. They're physical. They're a pain in the ass to play against. Um, make the Shea case beyond steals. And I know your case extends well beyond the fact that he leads the league in steals. I mean, I'm not sure it necessarily has to because I think steals are just so dramatically underrated is a, a positive thing you can do defensively. But, you know, his 
his on-off numbers are pretty solid. It, it's interesting because he's the one guy out of this group that doesn't regularly defend the opponent's best player. And that's, you know, Lou Dort, typically in Oklahoma City, who's, uh, I, I can't remember if I've had him on all, an all-defensive team. I, I think he's had stronger cases in past years than he does this year in, in terms of his impact numbers. But it's someone who doesn't necessarily generate as many of these high impact plays defensively as Shea does. And I think that it's it's largely just my vote for those are more important than on ball defense, even though that's what people tend to gravitate toward to toward during all defensive voting. It's interesting because we went through a phase where steals were almost dismissed as the product of reckless gambling. I feel like Monte Ellis became the poster child for that of just a guy who gets a lot of steals, but everybody agrees he's not a good defensive player. Um, I agree with you. They've become undervalued just for the simple fact that not only do they end the opponent possession without a shot, without a foul, without a chance at an offensive rebound, but they kickstart your possession going the other way with an enormous advantage. Um, do you, do you feel like they're still not, not properly valued? And do you feel like Shea for whatever reason I don't even know how this would be provable other than the fact that the Thunder's defense is like really, really good when he's on the floor is able to accomplish those steals without getting out of position and, and torpedoing the defense. I do feel that way. I mean, just his length in the passing lanes and in, in concert with, you know, kind of the, the length that the Thunder are throwing out there at every position. I don't think he's compromising them in, in pursuit of it. You know, it'd be interesting to kind of break down. I do think most like, it is passing steals that are probably more of a gamble than on ball, ball steals. And I do think probably the the vast majority of his are, you know, passes that are he's intercepting. But uh, he's also really good at if you try to post him up, like if teams get a switch and they try to post him up, he's incredibly good at poking the ball away from behind in those situations. But uh, defensive EPM, which is something I leaned on a lot here from dunks and threes, he's seventh in the league that there. Uh, you know, I'm not necessarily going to have everyone ahead of him, but it, it's a really solid mark. Um, yeah, and, and to your original question about can steals still be undervalued, I, to me, I think of it like threes for a long period of time. Like we have a long ways to go to jack up the value on steals before they're properly valued. And the guy who's going to be the really interesting litmus test on this. I don't know if he's on your radar at all because, you know, the draft is still three months away, three and a half months away. Reed Shepard at Kentucky. Everyone's going to, kind of think of him as a defensive liability because he's undersized he's athletic but not supremely athletic and you know he's but he has an off the charts steal rate which is especially notable because one of the features of kentucky prospects under Jan, john calipari has been for the most part they don't have good steal rates including i'm not even sure shay's steal rate was that good in college but his is outstanding and that's one reason why he's like breaking all the the statistical projections that, that people are running for this year's draft I guess another thing with SGA making all defenses, it I'm this is gonna sound sacrilegious and is actually a compliment to the Thunder and goes to your point about how he does not guard the best player on another team, nor should he, by the way. That's not his stature or position for the most part. Is he one of the three best defenders in the Thunder starting lineup? I I think so. I could I think you could fairly argue he's not one of the the two best defenders. I, I'd have a hard time elevating Jalen Williams over him. Jalen Williams is asked to do as much of the grunt work, maybe even as Dort. Like when they play a big four, it just falls. Like when they play Minnesota with Towns, it's just like, okay, JW got to guard Towns tonight. Like just make it happen and just deal with it. Uh, and he's, good enough he holds up and obviously chet is chet i assume he got some consideration from from you as well his rim protection has been extraordinary for a rookie even a red shirt rookie and dort is dort i guess that's what i came up against with sga's cases he and that's not this is why the thunder have been a top five defense and have the inside track at being the number one freaking seed in the western conference with carl anthony towns out in minnesota tumbling not tumbling but slipping back a little bit what a story it would be, by the way. I know it's a dumb thing. Like, th what's the difference going to be between the one seed and the two seed? A game, two games. Like, you're qualitatively the same team. It still would be pretty incredible if the Thunder pull this off and are the number one seed 
And, you know, that could get them not a great opponent, but it would be incredible. Yeah, a team that uh, neither, neither of us were sure was going to gonna hit their over this year. Both of us were were under on them back in the preseason. So, Whoops. Yeah, uh, you know, I thought they were still a year away, and uh, it turns out, no, they were very much not a year away. So why do you hate Derek White? <laughs> I don't. I mean, Derek White is awesome. He's probably... He's probably number three on this group to me. I, I would probably have Herb Jones a little bit ahead of him uh, in, in addition to Caruso. But I mean, the the shot blocking at guard, the defensive responsibility that he's, you know, asked to to carry on a team that has Drew freaking Holiday. Like he's he's right there for me the, without question. I guess I have to ask the same question of Derek White that I just asked for SGA. I do think on balance... I think he's – has he been the best defender in the Celtics starting five? That is a hard bar to jump, man. Drew is still Drew. Don't feel like he's been quite the same this year, but that's part of that's partly because they're just using him in wildly unconventional ways in some of these matchups, and you know, and and that helps their overall defense to screw with the other team like that. Like, oh, where's Drew Holiday? He's over there? Well, that means Porzingis is over there. What the hell are we doing? Oh, there's eight on the shot clock. We haven't done anything yet because we're just trying to figure out who the hell is where. I do buy into he's he's not in the all defense conversation. He's not on the short short list for me, but I do buy that this is Jalen Brown's best defensive season ever. I don't think it's going to put him on either of my all defensive teams, but I think he's had his best defensive season ever. And Tatum might be right there with him. Like this team is absolutely loaded. I just feel like what Derek White does at the point of attack sets the tone for everything that ripples down below that the fact that he can block shots from behind it's impossible to screen he can switch i don't know Who, who's who's been the most impactful boston defender does it matter for this I it think, matters yeah i i think relative to position certainly it's been white and and that's why but but what you're saying about the depth of their starting lineup defensively all of those guys were on my you know middle middle list i guess which is like 25 to 30 players and that's why I was comfortable only taking one of them because I think it's more about just not having any weaknesses than necessarily how many outstanding defenders they have. Um, while we're talking Wolves playoffs, I don't think I saw you right on Towns um, injury and I haven't listened to Wendy's pod yet from yesterday. What's your, what's your sort of like, pro let's just, let's just say he's out. I, I don't even know what to say. Like he could be out for some time right before the playoffs in the, I, I think you said early in, the Western Conference playoffs, whatever that means. What's your take on what this means for the Wolves, short-term, long-term? I want to hear it. Yeah, I think it's very context-dependent on how the bottom half of the, East, uh, the West standings fall because it does seem like it's very likely now that they're going to slip out of the top two. Uh, the This matchup against the, the Clippers coming up is going to be crucially important for them staying in three, which, you know, I I guess I don't, I don't know where you want to be <laughs> in the West the West State, it's exactly because it's it's all going to kind of depend how things shake out below that. Because, you know, I we this is what we did talk all about at length on the uh, Hoop Collective this week. Like as well as New Orleans has played, and they are number two in net rating since the in season tournament, behind only the Celtics. They're still probably your second choice to face out of this group of teams you could potentially face in the West after Sacramento, just because of the sheer lack of star power relative to, you know, some of these more veteran teams that have not been very good and have not necessarily been healthy in the regular season. So if I'm, it, if I'm Willie green, I'm clipping that I, and I'm clipping whatever all you knuckleheads talked about on the hoop collective and I'm playing <laughs> it on a loop for my team. They want to face us over Phoenix who can't stay healthy for five seconds. Now, Phoenix is healthy again. I saw them play last night in Cleveland. They look dangerous sometimes, and sometimes, like, eh, defensively, are they just too small, too not really in your face? They want to play us over Dallas? Or I can't, you know, it's Luka. Can't really get too up in arms in that. But, man, they are playing really well, and that ain't no picnic. I'm clipping it. I'm clipping Willie Green, clip it. They're disrespecting you. It's disrespectful. You can definitely overstate that most best player on the court in a short series thing. It, uh, uh, I I wrote about this back in 2017, and when the lesser seed has you know the best player on the court, it does increase their chances of pulling the upset, but it's still not better than 50-50. So, you know, again, from Minnesota standpoint, I would probably rather be in a situation where I, with Anthony Edwards, have the best player on the court, but. 
you know, even if that's probably the most favorable situation to be in with Carl Anthony Towns potentially missing some or all of that series. But uh, yeah, it uh, definitely makes the path forward a lot more difficult for them. We're, wait, wait a second. In this, who would the Timberwolves pick to play draft from the perspective of who's who's the quote unquote friendliest, easiest opponent? Were the Lakers and the Warriors a part of this draft? I I mean, I think, you know, the uh, the Warriors may, may be in a different category at this point. I don't know. But the Lakers, yes, I think they're still a dangerous enough playoff opponent. And then their size... I think potentially is an issue for Minnesota specifically. Like I love the matchup against Sacramento for them because the length that they can throw at Rudy Gobert, even without towns. I hope, I hope Willie green hears all this, the Lakers who have a negative point differential that they're, they're, they're saying, they're saying you new Orleans Pelicans are a less dangerous opponent for the Minnesota Timberwolves. I just hope, hope they hear that. let's just get, let's just get right to the, the top line storyline. When Benyama, all defense, yes or no. No. And it's interesting because the all in one metrics still tend to say yes, because of the fact that his box score stats are so ridiculous. Uh, you know, I have a metric that's strictly box score and like he's, he's as far ahead of everyone else in the league as everyone else in the league is from a average, basically like that's, that's how off the charts, what he's doing. Uh, the Spurs are an improved defense recently. Uh, this is one of the things I wanted to talk about that since kind of they, they started playing the real lineup, they're 23rd in defensive rating after being, you know, in 30th or whatever, 29th, maybe below before that. So that's a very encouraging sign. You still have a hard time putting somebody from a defense that, that that's that mediocre. And I do think, you know, Wemby's still figuring out how to be impactful, you know, where, where are the gambles I can take those sorts of things still figure it out in real time, but uh, he's a legitimate contender without question. I would lean yes right now. And it's a little, you let's just like the Spurs are 14 and 51 as we're recording this. Let's just say I didn't think too hard about the all defense candidacies for the uh, respective members of the Washington Wizards of the Detroit Pistons, who are 11 and 53, not far from the Spurs in the standings. It is a highly unusual situation where the Spurs allow 120 points per 100 possessions with Wemby on the bench and 112 when he plays. That's like top seven ish defense in the league. Now, that sounds really good and it is really good. And it's like, the Heat with Bam are about 110.5. Uh, the Clippers with Kawhi, who we haven't mentioned yet, are 111. So it's not like it's so far behind, like best defender, good team. You want that number to be pretty low, ideally even lower than, oh, the equivalent of the seventh or eighth best team. But given the surrounding talent, I think that's pretty remarkable. The advanced numbers adore him. 52% um, shooting at the rim by Spurs opponents when he's around is an elite, elite figure. I know it's only box score stats, but almost five stocks per game between steals and blocks is just absolutely ridiculous. 4.3 blocks per 36 minutes. By the way, you know who's like right behind him in blocks per 36 minutes? Not that he really belongs in this conversation. Walker Kessler is like blocking shots every two seconds he's on the floor. Um we I didn't realize friend. that until I looked up his rim protection number, the rim, rim protection numbers last night. And yeah, he's like still there at two or three in the league. Like, and teams oh, are okay. shooting 49% at the basket against Walker Kessler. That's basically number one in the league among big men who face shots there regularly. And yet there's something about him that clearly Utah's coaching staff has decided, like, we're not going to go all in on him as a starting center. They're sure now injuries have forced their hand a little bit recently, and they're starting him and John Collins together I, that's a topic i'd like to dig into more in the offseason is like what does he not do offensively i think he probably regressed a little bit um from last year maybe that's maybe that's all it is i i don't know man it's hard for, it's hard for me to say that there are 10 better defensive players than women yama but maybe there are neither are the bucks i mean it's it's hard for me to say that about Giannis too yeah it's that's that's one of the questions i wanted to bring to this is like in terms of on off impact and even the all in one metrics, just nowhere close to where they were the last, 
you know, a couple of years when those guys were fixtures and and even frequently on the defensive player of the year ballot. And I don't think it's necessarily any drop off that they've had. I think it's mostly how they were deployed much of the season under Adrian Griffin. Like, do we hold that against them? It, I, I don't quite know what to do with that one. Like statistically they don't belong, but there, there is sort of a qualitative, I don't think it's their fault element. Yeah, statistically, their st- their stuff, at least what I looked at, is is still good. Like it's it's not as like elite as it has been. Um, the rim protection is still great. They're still way up there in that. Yeah, and the team is better defensively with them on the floor. The uh, Lopez off the floor, Giannis on the floor has been a disaster defensively for Milwaukee. Again, I can't like pin that on Giannis. It's like Giannis trying to plug every hole in the dam all at the same time. Um, I didn't know. I don't know quite what to do with those those two yet. I, I want to. Sh- well, I have Kawhi on my short list. Um, what do you, tell me about Kawhi's candidacy in your mind? Because there's been slow start, slow first 10, 15 games. Since then, he hasn't. We'll never see peak Kawhi again. Tw- Twenty seventeen Kawhi was like from another planet, just snatching bodies and taking the ball and just single handedly. It was like having seven defensive players on the floor. Basically, was having 2017 Kawhi. He's been pretty goddamn good and taking on the toughest assignments for entire games if the Clippers ask him to. I'm pretty comfortable with him in like the final 15 guys for these 10 spots. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I so I, I've listed eight guys that are in for me right now. That the next year on the perimeter, we mentioned. Jane McDaniels and Edwards from Minnesota, Dylan Brooks, because I think we probably need to talk about someone from Houston, given how good the Rockets defense has been this season. It has to be him, right? Who else would it, who else could it be? Yeah, I, I think it does have to be. I mean, hasn't played enough minutes. Thompson twins are coming defensively. Dude, the Thompson twins are coming for your five by fives. God, now this is my new thing. I just think about five by five games all the time. They are, again, if they could just shoot, it it's all in front of them because they do everything else really well. And not just people who haven't watched the Pistons or the Rockets are going to pigeonhole them as, well, they must just be the, the athletic rangy guys who make plays, steals blocks. They do all of that. They're also smart, competitive players who have a decent feel for the game, given their age. I just, they're going to have to make shots. Like it's at some decent level, but I don't, they're coming. You're right. They're coming. And the other guys we haven't mentioned on the on the interior that are in contention for me, uh, Kawhi I think is at the top of that list. I think he would he would be on one of my on my second team if we did this today. Uh, Aaron Gordon, and then the guy who like statistically is having a massive impact hasn't played a ton of minutes, but uh, Isaiah Hartenstein. Yes, he's on my short my medium list. My medium list. He's he's I mean make the case he's really good he's just a really good Isaiah Hardenstein is really good like and he's played more minutes than ever before like he used to be a fifteen minute a game just go out there and mess stuff up foul some people throw some elbows and then he'll come out of the game exhaust yourself and your fouls for fifteen minutes that's all we need now they like need him to play. He's had 40 minute games this year and looks every bit the part of a good starting center. He's number one in. EPM, a fancy adjusted plus minus in the whole stinking league. He gets steals. He gets blocks. His rim protection numbers are off the charts. The Knicks are a great defensive team when he's on the floor. I don't think it's crazy for him to be in this conversation. Yeah, I think you made the case there. I mean, that that was basically it. And, you know, he's played less than 100 fewer minutes than Alex Caruso. So if I'm going to consider Alex Caruso for defensive player of the year, I can't. I don't know how much I can hold minutes against Isaiah Hartenstein in that context. A couple other guys I wanted to shout out. You hit Aaron Gordon. Just a splendid all-around player. Contavious Caldwell-Pope. There's been kind of a groundswell for him. I I can't quite get there in this group. Maybe it's just his size, although he scales up better than you think. Um, He's he's just awesome. Uh, um, Who else did I want to shout out? And Nick Claxton, I'm not dying to shout out. He's fine. Isaac Okoro, where did Isaac Okoro land for you? Yeah, he didn't make my my medium size list. That's interesting. Uh, the, the Cleveland was the team that 
is near the top of the defensive rankings that, you know, didn't have anybody on my short list. And, you know, the, the metrics kind of suggest their most impactful defender defenders this year have been Evan Mobley, who, as we said, is ineligible. And then the guy who's had a shocking impact in terms of on off is a uh, fellow low post guest, Dean way. Yeah. Dino. know, um, yeah, I can't, Someone tried to lobby for Dean Wade. Again, he just came on the podcast a week ago um, as an all-defensive player. And I said, look, I love Dean Wade. I, I don't think he's one of the 10 best defensive players in the NBA. With all due respect to Dean Wade, I cannot quite get there. Uh, I think Okoro's been awesome. Jared Allen's been very good, too. He's worthy of of a look. Okoro's been awesome. You know, there's a name that neither of us has mentioned. And I think it's interesting that neither of us has mentioned him. And I wonder what, if anything, it says. The incumbent defensive player of the year, Jaron Jackson Jr., has not even gotten a whiff of a mention. And I think he's going to hit the game's limit, is he not? I, I think he is. I didn't look specifically at it, though. Well, I'm going to look it up now, but why? What what has happened to Jaron Jackson Jr.? It's starting like for FIBA and Team USA, where he just couldn't stay on the floor and couldn't get a rebound. Till now, where I think offensively, given the complete wreckage around him, I think this season is going to be good for him offensively. He's had some of his best passing games, some of his highest assist games. He's had to figure out ways to get points without people feeding him, and that's going to be great for him as as John Morant comes back and Desmond Bain comes back. Maybe that's all it is. Maybe it's just he's had to expend so much more energy there. He hasn't been the same guy defensively. But even his rim, you always thought like at the very least, he'll commit fouls. His rebounding numbers aren't good. They're even worse this year. He just does not get rebounds. Um, You always thought at the very least, the rim protection will be fearsome. The rim protection numbers will say, even in this context, this this, this is a no-fly zone. That has They're just okay. Like what what's happened? What's going on with Jaron Jackson Jr.? Yeah, he's in the, you know, kind of the tier here with Derek Lively, DeAndre Ayton, Daniel Gafford, like good rim protectors, but not not elite ones. And I I guess I think the combination of of all the things you mentioned and then just the defensive personnel on the perimeter not being what it's been in past years or or alongside him at center, uh, you know, has has put him in worse positions to contest shots. Uh, you know, Marcus Smart was someone who had pretty good defensive numbers during the limited games that he played. And, you know, they've been without him all all season. So, you know, Vince Williams Jr. has sort of been had to step into that role of stopper. And, you know, I think for a guy who was a two-way player, he's outstanding in that role. Compared to Dylan Brooks and Marcus Smart, that's a pretty big drop-off. By the way, another player who we haven't mentioned, and I, I don't, you know, in the in the playoff, we have mentioned it, but not in this context. I believe Jimmy Butler is also going to fall. I think the most he can get to is now 63 games. So he's going to fall short of all of these discussions as well. Yep. Not maybe he probably doesn't care, but um, just as, just as an FYI, I think that's all I got to say on all defense. Um, I got, I got one more name that we haven't mentioned. Oh, I, I think can't, I, I can't wait. He, he can't make the teams. He hasn't played enough. I don't know if he's in it. I didn't even look up if he's eligible, but Jonathan Isaac, oh, when he is out there, he's not eligible. A game wrecker. Let me let me uh, just make you talk and I'll check if he's eligible. I don't think he is though. I, yeah, I'm 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 pretty sure he's not. But you know, you talked about that Orlando defense and Jalen Suggs in the starting lineup is is the biggest key to it. Goga Bataze also some decent defensive numbers in the limited minutes he played. But Isaac, when he's out there, he is he just makes so many things happen. He is impossibly athletic for someone his size. Yeah, he has played 44 games, so he's not going to make 65. Um he averages 15 minutes a game, so that's also kind of a problem. Um, I think per minute, he might be the best defense player in the entire league. Now, part of the value of being the best is to be out there to be the best, and he hasn't been out there enough. And I think that's one of the biggest. Orlando, look, they're sitting at fifth right now. This is all gravy for them. It's all gravy. They are one of the most interesting teams to watch over the next 18 months because they have a every bit of flexibility trade wise and cap wise you could want. They have a window as Bobby Marks has said here of a financial flexibility before Bancaro and Wagner have to be paid. They need guards, guards, guards. 
but a, a certain kind of guard. Like I, I don't get the sense that they are. I think they'll look at everything, but I think they are justifiably wary of how how much of ball handling duty do we want to siphon away from these two young star forwards that we have, including Bancaro, who has stepped all the way into stardom this year. I mean, Wagner has been just decent. Bancaro is ready for all of it. Um, and then Isaac is a mystery wrapped in a mystery wrapped in an enigma. Like if we ever can get to a world where he can give me 25 minutes a game for 65 games and however many playoff games they get that he is a complete game changer. And he's actually started making his threes lately. He's up to 34% on three, which means he's hot lately. If he can just become an average spot up three point shooter, what he does defensively, cause it's on anybody it's on, you can put him on a six, one point guard, a six, eight point forward, a power forward, a center, like you can put him on anybody. And the effect is the same. That dude is erased from the game. Like even Tatum has not looked comfortable when they put Isaac on Tatum, Tatum's like, Oh my, what is this? I, what am I supposed to do with this? Um, another topic I wanted to hit with you. There's been a lot of um, talk about scoring being down since the all-star break free throws being down since the all-star break and whether this is some concerted top-down reaction to the scoring explosions on the team and individual level that happened before the all-star break. And we know that there was a bunch of 60 and a couple 70 point games. Um, and no one knows this kind of data better than you. I know you did some research. What is that? What, what statistically is actually going on and what was most interesting to you that you found? Yeah, our buddy Tom Haberstroh on his Substack, the Tom the Finder, was the first person I saw to kind of highlight this, and you know other people, uh, Seth Partnow and his analysis on the the Dunked On newsletters looked into it, and kind of the conclusion is always the same: that free throw rate is really driving this. The scoring actually peaked before the the sixty and seventy point explosions. Like those are an imperfect measure of where scoring is. Uh, it was still basically the same, you know, 115.6 points per game on February 9th. And since then is when it's been trending down on a season level since February. Maybe, maybe 9th. the Hawks have just played fewer games <laughs> since February 9th. Since February 9th, it's down to 112.4 points per game. So down over three points per game from what the average was prior to that. Now, you know, like scoring is crashing. It's still more than the league averaged at any point between 1971 and 2022. So we're still seeing a lot of points, but not quite as many. And uh, free throw attempts, like shooting is down a tiny bit. Turnovers are up a little bit. Offensive rebounding is down. But I I do think the turnovers and the shooting, like it's a small enough difference that those can potentially be explained by the fact that foul calls are down. And look, typically we see scoring tends to be pretty flat over the course of the season. Uh, pace goes down. You know, it goes down starting at the beginning of the year when players are fresh. But offensive rating typically goes up and offensive rating is down over the last month plus here. The free throw attempts in February were the third lowest per game in any month in NBA history. And they're slightly lower than that so far. In, in March. any month in NBA history. Yeah. I mean, look, free throw rates, part of it, part of the mis, uh, misunderstanding, I think, about when scoring was way up that, you know, I hope to address in the the piece that Tom, that Tim Bonteps and I wrote. Uh, a few weeks ago was people are like, oh, the rules favor offense. You know, everybody's going to the free throw line constantly. It's like the, the whistle is constantly blowing. It's like, no, actually, free throw rates are at an all time low, you know, even before that point. And they've gone down since then. So, you know, really. But what we have seen is that level of officiating can offset some of the skill in the shot making that has developed in the league. It does. I'm interested to see how the next month or so and then the playoffs persist because it does seem to be that there is more physicality allowed for in the last two weeks than there was than there was before. Every game, and it's it's not just I noticed it with stars like Kobe White had a couple shots last night for the Bulls where he got pretty mauled and there was no call. Um, it does seem to be like they are letting players play more than they were before the season and allowing for more physical contact, which is interesting because to your point, when I talked about this two and three months ago and it was, Oh my God, it's a crisis. My challenge to people was, okay, what's your solution? And you can't say hand checking. What's the solution. And it's, it was once you ban 
well, just let defense players push guys around all over the floor as an answer. It actually was tough for people to come up with answers because I think, I don't know what percentage of the pie <laughs> this accounts for, but for me, the scoring explosion is 70% just everyone can shoot now. And it's really hard to play defense and teams not only have many more skilled shooters that can make longer shots, they're just smarter about how they deploy all those players and what shots they hunt. And it's just harder for defenses, almost no matter how physical they're allowed to be to cover all that space. That's the, I, do you disagree like that? I don't know what percentage of the scoring increase I just described to like three is greater than two. Everybody realized this. Everybody realized that shooting more threes also helps you get easier twos. Like it's just hard. Yeah, no, I think that's the the fundamental factor. And I do think that benefited from the rules changes that happened in terms of, you know, taking out the illegal defense and allowing zones back in the early 2000s and then reinterpreting the hand checking rule in 0405. But those things existed for like a decade and scoring was basically flat. It's only in the last, you know, seven or eight, nine years that we've seen scoring increasing like it has. And I think that's the result of, kind of all those things that you mentioned kind of propagating through the system so that players are growing up shooting threes, their coaches are growing up having them shooting threes, the step back three, like making like these are shots of increased difficulty that we're still making at the same three point percentage or higher that we were a decade ago when the, there was a lot higher percentage were catching shoots and a lot higher percentage were coming from the corner. Well, and this is like the old Daryl Morey thing of like Daryl Morey could walk into the league 12, 15 years ago and gain an enormous advantage just by shooting threes. And like that advantage is over. Everyone's like, oh, we should do that too. Now we all shoot a gazillion threes, except for some teams still don't and they win anyway. That's by the way, I wanted to talk to you about this. This is just off the top of my head. You know, I never bought into it. And I remember thinking specifically about the Warriors Rockets rivalry of peak James Harden against the KD Warriors. And that the, the rivalry obviously predates KD as well. Um, it was just a delightful rivalry in every possible sense. The contrast in styles, the contrast in personalities. It got into like, what is the soul of basketball? This is a battle for what this sport is supposed to be. Um, and I always looked at it as there was, a, there was a period of time where, I think Jeff Van Gundy used to talk about this a lot, where there was a, the idea that, stylistic homogeneity was hurting the game that every team was playing the same way spread pick and roll kick out for three and there were definitely more of that like as this math took over that style is kind of like the default like if we're just building a team we have to figure out how to play in two days though that's just the easiest way to do it get a roller get some shooters get a ball handler and go um i used to always look at those games and be like man these are two teams that can work their way to pretty similar shot distributions but are playing totally different sports and i just there's no way to measure this but you just look around the league the top four teams in the west oklahoma city denver minnesota clippers just could not be more different styled stylistically the celtics versus the knicks and the sixers it's just it's so different and i was talking about this with somebody on a team last week and they boiled it down to it just all stems from who your best player is. Like the best players on all these teams play very differently and the styles flow from that. But I just wonder, like, have you noticed that? Is it something you enjoy? Like I'm, I was thinking today about all these potential playoff matchups. I'm like, these are just all so interesting. All these teams are so different from each other. It seems like that concern is for good reason, just dead and buried, like that everyone pl allegedly plays the same way. But no one specifically says it. They only say it when they're complaining about it, not when they're saying it's a, it's a good thing in terms of the stylistic diversity. And I think a lot of that goes to, and this is like what I was saying about propagating through the system, the skill of big men being so incredible. So, you know, Joel Embiid is, you know, more or less the size of Shaq, more or less the physically dominant player that Shaq was. But, oh, he also shoots 80% from the free throw line and makes threes. Like, what do you deal with that? Nikola Jokic being seven foot tall and, you know, one of the greatest passers, regardless of size, regardless of position in NBA history, and also, you know, one of the softest touches we've ever seen. Like, I, I think those teams in particular in the return of the big man has kind of eased a lot of that concern because, you know, even though, though the Warriors and Rockets were playing differently, they were both still playing kind of outside in rather than inside out at all.
That's a really good point. And and Jokic is obviously Jokic and Embiid, but but Giannis is just a battering ram. Shea Gilgis Alexander is like a battering ram of a different kind, like a smaller, slithier, bat- slithier, whatever, whatever that word is. It, it's the same general principle of just I'm going north south. I'm going to get in your paint and go from there. I think the league is. I don't mind them. The refs, if if this if they are letting them play more, if there's any intentionality behind this, I think that's fine. But I think the league stylistically is in an awesome place. I mean, the Pelicans is just like Zion's a, a complete unicorn player. Like there's nobody, nobody like him. I want to, I, I watched them last night against the Cavs because they're back in full health. Devin Booker came back. The big three is back. And so it's now time for the Suns at 38 and 27, having traded everything to build this team to get moving, to get going. And for them, given their schedule, that is as simple as like stay out of the play-in tournament. But I I wonder just sort of 65 games in now, back healthy. I don't know if you caught any of their game. They squeaked one out in Cleveland last night without the Cavs are missing Mobley, Mitchell, among, Struess, among others. Dean Wade Dean Wade was also out. Um, you, they were missing Evan Mobley. Isaiah Mobley was getting some run last night. That's fair. He did. He made it three, two. Um, uh where are you on the Suns? Like, can, can can this team actually pull this together? Because if because you're talking about a run now that could have to go through three of those top four teams consecutively without home court advantage. Yeah, I mean, there's there's no precedent for, I guess the Houston the '95 Rockets are the precedent in terms of winning a championship without home court advantage in any round, which they're basically assured of. But I do think. Compared to, you know, you, you joked about the Warriors and the Lakers, the other teams that have like these aging stars in the Western Conference, Phoenix, I think, has shown a higher top end when these guys are healthy with the, you know, the way the five man lineups, including, you know, Beal, Booker and and Durant have performed, uh, which like they're starting five. I looked this up yesterday and cleaning the glass. It's shooting like 46 percent from three, which doesn't even seem that fluky, given the quality of looks they're getting and Grayson Allen's ability as a shooter. So I do think they have a higher top end and there is potentially a path like they're the flip side of that Minnesota argument. Like, yes, you know, Phoenix is in the bottom half of the the bracket for a reason. I don't think Phoenix would be should be favored in that series. But if you happen to draw Minnesota without Carl Anthony Towns in the first round, like that's a that's a winnable series. And away we go from there. There's no question that offensively they have the firepower to beat anybody defensively. They're just never going to be that good. Like they're just, I just have, I just, I think they're about 15th, 16th, something like that. 14th. I don't know. Last time I checked, I just think they're maxing out there. I don't think they have, I don't think this is like a Denver situation where they get into the playoffs and they can suddenly lock in and be a top seven defense. They're just too small. People just don't feel them. There are too many communication errors on the perimeter and Nurkic is, fine just fine but even you've seen a number of recent games including last night where they try to hide him on it was Isaac Okoro or Isaiah Mobley last night and put Durant on the opposing screen setter so they can switch and mess up your offense that way just fine that's a good tactic I think Royce O'Neal is a huge help for rounding out their lineups with shooting defense screening and passing I think their ceiling is is pretty high just because their offense is so good I just it's it's a it's a, a profile you can win with like number one ish offense number fifteen ish defense but the offense has to be that good like I just don't see I just don't think they're gonna have a series where it's like uh, we're locking in on defense now and for the offense to be that good even with Royce O'Neal giving them a little bit more depth these guys their stars have to be healthy the entire playoff run and I don't know why we would count on that at this point all right Kevin Pelton what else we got coming from you this week what should we look for. Uh, I, let's see. I, well, I'm actually writing about, I, I, I alluded to this, the, the Durant, uh, Steph Curry, LeBron James triumvirate of former MVPs trying to win more champion, one more championship and how little precedent that is historically for players at their age to do that as the, the best player on a championship team. So got that coming soon. Look out for that. Kevin Pelton does everything for us. Second to none. We appreciate your time. I'm sorry that the Kraken let you down at the trade <laughs> deadline, but no, uh, hope- it was it was good. But they need to look to the future. Okay, well, maybe next year. Kevin Pelton, everybody, thank you, sir. Thanks for having me.